Okay, y'all ready? You want to get this going? Yes. I think no. So. I no. Quit. Oh. We are I'm having done. fun. Really? Oh, Cindy, I forgot to tell you, I quit. Goodbye. <laughs> That's right. That's what we do before webinars, Dustin. Sherry will say, are you ready? And we're like, no. <laughs> I quit. Or send, or send, or send a little, send in disease, you know, that we're sleeping or that we don't want to do this or we quit. And- that's funny. All right. So I'm going to, that's for recording. So we're recording this and we're going to take the audio, probably make a little podcast out of it, but welcome all 42 participants. Uh, oh, good. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so we're going to wrap up the series. We're going to talk about what you all want to talk about. So the questions that you want answered, go ahead and submit that. If you hit that Q and a button, type something in, we'll kind of, we'll go through as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, but yeah, you know, D and Cindy, uh, are all yours uh, for the next uh, hour uh, or so. So we're going to start off just kind of giving quick introductions uh, to get an idea of who we are, um, and then we'll just kind of go into the, the topic at hand. So I'm Dustin Jones. I'm a home health physical therapist in Lexington, Kentucky, y'all. Right there. <laughs> um, and I do a podcast called the Senior Rehab Podcast. So some of you all listen to it, but probably a lot of you don't because uh, you're OTs or CODAs. <laughs> Uh, because you listen to the awesome Mandy Chamberlain. Mandy, who are you? <laughs> oh, who am I? I'm Mandy Chamberlain. I'm an occupational therapist, and I run SeniorsFlourish.com and the Seniors Flourish podcast. Yeah, and I'm really excited about this. I think it's going to be amazing. I think it's also like really awesome that we all get to like hang out together mm-hmm. and uh, share Cindy and Dee's expertise. Um, yeah. So welcome everyone that follows me and hangs out with Dustin. <laughs> We're glad you're here. So everyone sees kind of the blank uh, black box that says Sherry Teague. Uh, <laughs> black come box, from the sorry. dark depths of the internet and tell us who, who you are. She's muted. Oh, I just want to wait for a second. Hi, I'm Sherry. I'm the Kraken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Quick actually, introduction, Sherry. I tried to hide yeah. mine, um, Dustin, so that you guys – So it. it said that show non-video participants that I hid mine so I'm surprised it's showing up on everybody's maybe it's just showing up on y'all's not everybody else's yeah we just it's see a black screen. oh what am I supposed to be doing right now introduction, introduction, yourself. introduction of who you are because everyone sees you uh, that box <laughs> well, I'm sorry I fell asleep my name is Sherry Teague and I and I have to wrangle these two ladies in the top boxes um I'm actually known known amongst you also known as the ampersand um, in Cornetian craft. And my job is to do all the coordinating and, um, <clears throat> stuff like that. So I, that's why I'm a mystery person in this. <laughs> I won't be answering any questions. Okay. Oh, have- <laughs> uh, Cindy. Um, I'm Cindy craft and I've been accused on more than one occasion of being a closet <laughs> OT. I'm kind of concerned looking at this screen. It looks like the staffing pattern of most home health agencies, three to one at a minimum. Um, so we need to definitely get the OT voice out there more. Um, been a PT for, oh gosh, we figured it out, 25 years and have spent the last 20, almost 21 in home health. Mm. The, so but there, there, a lot of stuff has changed, but it, uh, I can't see myself in any other setting. Yeah. Mm. I'd probably get fired. <laughs> <laughs> I tried a little bit in a sniff. I did for a little while and they yeah. told me how busy they were and they have not asked me to ever come back in almost a year. So I'm pretty sure I messed something up. <laughs> uh, somebody is poking the bear saying Brady 12 on the chat, Cindy, because they see Peyton uh, in the background. That's not Actually, Brady that's Andrew Luck. Yeah. That whoever, isn't Peyton. Patty, whoever you are, don't ask a question because she <laughs> No, that's Andrew Luck. We don't really want to discuss that one either. And I can't carry this out into my that's hallway right. where I do have a life-size Peyton Manning up on my wall outside my office. So. Yeah. 16. I'm sorry. That's right. D. I'm sorry. What? Let's do it. I'm D. Cornetti. <laughs> I'm the other part of Cornetti and Craft. I am an OLD therapist. I've been a therapist, a physical therapist, for about 30 years. I used to own um, my own um, home care, Medicare certified home care agency with Sherry Teague in Central Florida. And I now do consulting. I um, have succeeded. Uh, Cindy as the president of the home health section of the American Physical Therapy Association, where she uh, served an illustrious. Illustrious. That's a wow. good word. <laughs> served okay. illustriously for many ah. years. <laughs> that's not even a word. No. And um, very happy to be here. This is exciting. 
All right. Ask away. Ask away. Okay. So we have 12 questions right now. Um, we'll try and get to all of them. You know, y'all keep asking them uh, as if we, if we go through them pretty quickly. Uh, once again, for the people that just came in here, top right corner of your screen, you can change the speaker view, which will be helpful. All right. So first question, the fun one. We'll go, just get this go going. All right. <laughs> You're first. So Janelle Guerin, uh, she said, please, please chat with us about the pending COPs. How will this affect us in the home? Or how will this affect <laughs> us in the home the greatest? Mm. Go for it, Dee. The COPs are your baby. Um, well, there's major revisions to the COPs, um, and the only reason they haven't been put into place was because of a, a statute in a number of years when they first came out in the late 90s. Um, they are going to update uh, patient rights. They're going to update infection control type issues. They're going to update quality assurance. Um, but most importantly, um, I think what we have to look at is – um, compliance. The biggest thing here is compliance, compliance, compliance. And it's about not just getting it right, but how did we get it right? How do we reproduce that? How do we share that? And how do we continue to strive to reduce costs? So the COPs are huge. Um, don't be afraid of them. There are things that we should be doing anyway. There are things you want for your own family member, for yourself if you're in the healthcare industry. Um, but there is some administrative burden that's going to be associated with the COP. So if you haven't read it already, read through it. Um, Cindy and I have done some, some webinars specifically to this, specific to the COP. Um, in, they've been delayed overall um, to be implemented until January 13th, right, Cindy? Of 2018, January. Mm -hmm. And then the QAPI, the Quality Assurance Performance Improvement or uh, Continuous Improvement Efforts that are going to be very intrinsically geared to the agency, who you deal with, what you find, how you can improve upon what you do, um, will take effect next July. So that's been delayed now another six months on top of that to allow agencies to prepare. Here's what I would say <clears throat> um, about uh, the uh, QAPI. Know your data. Know your data. Know what you do well. Know what you don't do well. And these are things that are going to position you well to be partners with acute care facilities um, in these alternative payment models. Be aware of what that requires. And I would even challenge every PT, um, OT, PTA, and CODA, be involved in that process in your organization because it is very interdisciplinarily oriented. Um, we, it's, it's clinical expertise. It's not discipline specific roles and responsibilities like we've seen historically. And so, um, you could be a great asset to your organization by being part of, of, of the QAPI team. And, and it should be represented by more than just quality assurance nurse. I think a couple things also are that it pushes heavily on patient involvement and care planning. And I think we've gotten kind of lax in our documentation with the check boxes, you know, patient agreed to plan a care. Yeah. But we all know nobody's ever looked at us in our career and said, you know what, Dustin, my goal as your patient is I want to be able to ambulate 150 feet to my mailbox uh, with standby <laughs> assistance in my walker because my life would be amazing then. It's really going to challenge us to not do the obligatory check a box or say, yep, the patient agreed with me, which very often I think the box should just say patient didn't argue with my plan of care because um, I probably didn't tell them what it was. But it, to really get them involved, and I think it's going to shape a lot of our documentation and the goals in particular about does it really reflect the patient is actively participating? I think the other thing, especially on the heels of the proposed rule hitting yesterday, is when Dee's talking about therapist involvement and quality, we really have to bust the mold to stop it being about ambulation, bathing, and transfers. Mm -hmm. We really have to think bigger about how we reduce rehospitalization rates, how we keep people out of higher cost mm -hmm. care settings when they don't need to be in one, um, how we manage with pressure ulcers, how we deal with interfering pain. I, I hear as recently as this morning, the conversation with an agency that, you know, I really want to work on my outcomes and my therapist really need to focus on, and what do they go back to? The, th the therapy outcomes mm -hmm. of ambulation, bathing, and transfers. Yeah. 
Mm. And I think we have to think bigger in terms of what our impact really is on quality in home health and not stay relegated to the stereotypical boxes of, and then they subset it and say, well, ambulation is PT and bathing is, is OT and Yes, we know, but you got to use your data. But I absolutely agree. But yeah, I think right. our our historical risk is we get pigeonholed based on our disciplines to the idea mm-hmm. that we are responsible only for the quality things that sound like therapy, and that's going to bite us in the long run. Mm. Mm. So <clears throat> Sherry, uh, the blank screen at the bottom, she's going to post a link uh, in the chat for you all to read further um, about that topic that is pertinent to many people in this chat room. There it is, link. The COP, oh. so everyone, all the participants, <laughs> go ahead and check that out, and you can read further. Um, Dustin, did we get to the answer? Did we kind of help out a little so. bit? Or okay, yeah, I think so. Um, so yeah, let's go to the next next question, Mandy. What you got? Okay, so an anonymous attendee asked, like, what is the best way to truly document assessing a shower? Any question? Any thoughts on that? Well, defer to just, OT is what I see often written on the assessment. Yeah. I'm like, really? That that's your assessment ability. That do you deferred that, and you deferred the upper extremities, which apparently have no role in doing anything regarding PT, is to right. just do the arbitrary chop job. Well, what if it's an OT? Like you know, like sometimes I think when we're not able to always um, complete a bathing, we're supposed to always assess bathing initially, but we don't always are able to perform it. And so I think maybe the question is more from an OT standpoint, the mm-hmm. best way to address and assess like a shower and bathing. Like, it, is it how in depth does it need to be? Well, first of all, I don't think um, that you should be able to do um, a uh, range of motion assessment and a gross grip strength and then um, uh, analogize it to what it means for bathing. There has to be some, you know, the transfer of training is a real. So there has to be, you know, how are you getting yourself washed? Mm-hmm. There has to be. And I, we see a fair amount, right, Cindy, where mm-hmm. it's these simulations and they can hold the dressing stick, but there's nothing done. Can you get your stuff? Mm-hmm. You know, so, so actually doing it, you know, we all need to be a little bit from the show me state, show yeah. me how you do that. And, and, you know, I think if we always, we always talk to patients about, I'm here to keep you home. You know, I always say, give me your Jerry, I, I'm, do your best Jerry Maguire. Help me help you. <laughs> this is a problem. You need to do it. You don't need to be dirty, stinky, and naked because you got to go see the doctor, right, for your face-to-face. So, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to do something. And a lot of them, there's this modesty thing. I get it. But we actually have to physically do these tasks with patient because I've had patients say, oh, yeah, I get in and out of my shower. And then the PT walks through the bathroom doorway, which first of all, my head didn't blow off because I can walk in a bathroom with a patient. <laughs> and then I pull the curtain back and they've got this big deer in the headlights look and there's a chest of drawers in the shower. Yep. <laughs> and they're like, oh, you caught me. And I'm like, you know, so this idea that we're, we're taking patients' words for it, no offense, they're going to tell you, and they've been geared in most of the inpatient settings, to tell you what, what, you know, what they need to do to get you moving through the process and out their front door. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think it's that they don't want to participate i think that we have to make it clear that this is to help them help me help you second thing i'm going to say about assessing pick an objective measure i mean i love you ot i like it you're a little bit of the flower children right you know you're you're a little flowery about it you're gonna start talking about looms if you're not careful (laughs) you start describing a lot of stuff yeah. Right. And what we see in documentation is I see descriptions, OK, that are very generic and I don't see use of objective measures. Tie in your objective measures. Right. Um, if it's a gra- grasp issue, give me pinch and grip strength. If it's a dexterity mm-hmm. issue, where's your nine hole peg test? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I don't want you to rip out the loom or anything. We kid our friend who's an OT. Told you about the loom, right? <laughs> you know, don't start, don't start weaving stuff on. I say that jokingly. PT has, you know, we have, listen, we have diathermy, okay? <laughs> we can microwave anybody, okay? But I, I think you have to look at objective measures and you actually have to do something. Some of the, some of the documentation, okay, that we read is patient is verbal cues for bathing. And I mm. figure, right, Cindy, what, if, if you uh-huh. read verbal cues for bathing, what's your concept about what it takes for a person to bathe? Just tell them. Yeah. You <laughs> walk bathe. in the house and you say, hey, go take a bath. Boom. 
goal met. You know, so I think we have to talk about, you know, how we're measuring it. And then we actually have to do the components and we have to say, you know, if they need verbal cues for what? Sometimes it's sequencing, you know, you don't need somebody mm-hmm. taking their toothbrush and, and, you know, trying to wash, you know, you brush their hair with it. There's a lot of issues that come into play. So if it, so I've never had a patient tell me yes or no, if I didn't want them to. Right. And so you're saying, what do you mean by that? <laughs> It's Friday afternoon. Do you really want me to come? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) You know what I'm thinking, right? It's crazy. But you can say, listen, I got to get there. I got to have you do this. This is going to be in your best interest to keep you in your own home. Because we have to remember that that's what patients want. They want to stay in their own home. Mm -hmm. But Mandy, I also think part of what has always confused me from the OT perspective of analyzing Mm -hmm. bathing, whether Mm -hmm. it's in a facility setting or in the home, Mm -hmm. is it's never addressed in terms of can you even get to the bathroom, get right. to the shower? And I think it raises turf issues. And I've witnessed this where, you know, <laughs> PTs are screaming and yelling, you can never talk about ambulation because that's I mine. And I, I always say, really? Well, how'd they get the bathroom then? Float, crawl, roll? Yeah. I mean, are you just saying yeah. they, could, they, they magically appeared in the bathroom um, one day awesome. and then, then you jumped in there and did the shower quick and then you ran out and just said, good luck with that. I hope you like staying in here till the next time I come. Or maybe a PT will drive by and drive you to the mailbox. But I think that this issue is more about PT not doing an in-depth enough appropriate gait assessment. And the concern being when all I talk about is distance device and level of assistance, and then you go out and you say the same thing, it's like, oh my gosh, you're doing PT. You're not supposed to be doing PT. I need to be doing a better job of what I'm there to do. But Mm -hmm. the complete omission of can you even get to the shower to do it? I mean, I see assessments all the time with patients with, you know, significant fall risk or even the infamous, the bathroom is upstairs and they can't even get upstairs. And then I have OT telling me they assess bathing. How? The patient can't even get up the stairs to do it. So I, I know you're simulating maybe here in the living room, but that doesn't make any sense. If he can't even get to it, there's no way he's actually completing that task. Right. Right. That's a good point. Good point. Dustin, you're yes. on. Yeah, so next question. This is from, from Hattie Frey, who, Sandy, she's the one that accused you of being a Patriots fan. <laughs> uh, or Tom Brady Ooh, fan. Oh, Hattie. <laughs> oh, my. Rain down. <laughs> I see Cindy Kraft bowing up. Yeah, yeah. No, uh-huh. just, I'm ready. Hattie, Hattie said, I work in a Q rehab setting three years and love it. Struggling with capturing progress in words in regards to individualized activities from day to day, many constraints with everything that inpatient rehab has trying to be more efficient. So what would you all say to someone that's struggling to capture progress in words in their documentation, uh, just kind of on that individualized, um, you know, level? Well, I'll tee it up and then punch it to my better half. Um, I think part of it is we have to stop with this idea that we are mandated to show progress every single visit. Uh, I think that we have done this in the past. We have fallen in line because of the improvement standard, which CMS has, you know, been forced to admit was not appropriate to use that to say that your services were not going to be paid for unless the patient continuously showed improvement. Um, they lost that in the Jimmo case. They lost again in a recent settlement that says, you know what, you didn't do the greatest job educating the provider. So we were on the lookout for CMS education to both providers and auditors. Um, they are mandated to do it by the courts by September 4th, specific to the issue of maintenance care, that Mm -hmm. situation where progress is not the sole standard. And I think that we as therapists are so addicted to that idea of progress has to be shown that this has led to documentation of, you know, walk five feet more every time I see you, uh, three more reps of that arm exercise will get me there. Um, that if, you know, it's a slightly less or, or my personal favorite D in the batch I was recently reading every, you know, we're going to get half a grade stronger. Yay. Uh, and it's like, okay, that that's bigger than the number that started, or I'm going to really poke the bear D cause I saw a run of, they just wanted to increase Tenetti by two. Didn't matter what the Tenetti started out at. As long as you <laughs> increased it by two, you had objective improvement occurring all over the place. Mm. So I think it's realizing <laughs> that it's not going to pro- show part, even patients that you ultimately envision improvement, they're not going to improve every single visit. It's just not. So the issue is not, and I think we've allowed ourselves to be defined by that to the point where I see patient performed, patient completed, patient did. Were you even there? What was your contribution? I mean, the issue of skill is why did you need to be there for this visit to be successful? 
And it's successful if you did achieve some improvement. It's successful if you prevented decline. It's successful if you had to troubleshoot something that you didn't expect to rework this plan today based on the current presentation of the patient. But I think we've removed ourselves out of the documentation, and then we're struggling to say, how do I show this incremental change every time? Mm. So your thoughts on that, Dee? Yeah, yeah indeed. Um, sorry, I'm going to interrupt real quick. Okay. Speak to maintenance therapy, too, the state yeah, of therapy. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, oh, okay, please, so, you say that term and people cringe like you swore in church. I mean, people I know. probably fell over in their chair when I said it. <laughs> so so we'll, we'll, we'll hop back to that, but I did yep. have to tack on something to what Cindy said. When you're talking about progress or anything, I don't think we evaluate people um, uh, detailed enough. In other words, right. we have to pick the right measure to objectively quantify impairments. And then not only do we want to see what that quantifiable um, impairment is, we want to kind of categorize it, age, gender norms, et cetera. All right. But we also have these other things that come into play, um, whether their confidence is a factor their endurance, their, you know, you have somebody who has CHF and COPD, and um, maybe they've always been able to do this, but the energy consumption in the process of doing it is, is astronomical to the point where they're not safe and able to do it if they don't have support or assistance, or they just stop, they restrict their activity and don't do it. So at that point, what we're measuring is not, are they doing it or aren't, but we're measuring those finer things like their aerobic capacity, like um, are they self-monitoring, do they pace themselves? So there's other ways um, that we need to start to look at how we quantify impairments, and we have to tie it to using the uh, ICF model, and regardless the setting, we have this is what's been adopted by AOTA, APTA, and ASHA. You know the Holy Triumvirate of Therapy. This what we have to look at is how does that impairment impact a person's ability to participate in activities and continue to or resume participating in their normal social roles and responsibilities. Right? If this is a person who was the homemaker when they leave the the you know your inpatient rehab. Are they going to be able to go back home and do this? Do they live alone? Are they a caregiver for another person? We have to start to look at our patients a little bit more holistically than a stroke, a knee, you know, a person with dementia. And so uh, pick the measures that are specific that can help us quantify an impairment. But more than that, start to look at the global impact of it, right? Depression, anxiety, quality of life type things. Sometimes we can't change the severity of a disease process. Um, and we see that a lot with our chronic disease, um, that we're not healing these people. Either are the doctors, either are the nurses, either is anybody else that they receive medical care from. But why do we feel like we have to get them better? And what is better for them? Mm -hmm. What actually is better? And so this is where we can circle back around to what are patient goals and what's important to them. Yeah. Well, it kind of just... Uh... <laughs> Boom! Um, kind of just building on talking about like maintenance and that kind of thing. How how do you? One of the questions um, was about how do we script goals best for maintenance therapy? Well, how not to is to not put the word maintain in every single goal. Um, that's what we're starting to see is oh well, this is a maintenance patient, so I'm going to yeah. maintain this and I'm going to maintain that, and that'll take care of it. It's like, yeah. uh, I, I, there, we, there we go. <laughs> I can't use mine because it's holding up my computer right now. But, um, you know, I, I think No, I'm some not of trying it, to do self-promotion. I'm just saying it, it is a challenge. Right. Yeah. You know, you, you have to be a good goal writer. And if your goal writing now, right, is, is, is um, you check a box on an EMR because that's what they give you. We've had people tell us to our face, <sighs> I swear to you. I do what the box tells me. Yep. <laughs> it's just okay. trying to get it done. They're just trying yeah. to get it done. Yeah. And yeah. I understand. Yeah. But, I but, get but, it. <laughs> but you have to have a, a good template and a good discipline when it comes to writing a goal. And if you can write a good maintenance goal, your progress, you, you know, your rehabilitative, your improvement goals are a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. But I think the fundamental, the fundamental problem, D, is that we 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 feel like much like the progress conversation earlier that we're stuck with a certain template of goals that I have to say something about strength and then I have to mm -hmm. say something about balance and I have to say something <laughs> about an ADL and I have to say something about and and I think goals and especially in the light of the new COPs we got to look at this and say how are we connecting these? I'm not increasing strength just for the heck of it. I'm not trying to stabilize your balance issues just because I feel like it. 
there that connection in a goal statement that says, what am I measuring? What is that identified impairment? What is the functional relevance I'm really going after? Because when Dee and I do training on maintenance or on specifically around goals, I mean, some of the goals in those slides make people's eyes bug out because they're long. And, and, and we're very clear when we teach about documentation that our mantra is smarter, not more. This is not a volume issue because many times some of the longest notes with the most words don't say anything um, useful. So they'll say, well, wait a minute, you just said not to write, you don't need to write as much, but then your goals look way longer. It's like, yes, because you'd be better off with one or two well-crafted goals than 11, 12, or how many did you see in that one record that time, Dave, between all the disciplines? 101. Yeah, I don't think we need 101 goals. Discharged in two weeks, met 70. Oh, that's I know. pretty good. That's pretty, so can you give an example of a maintenance goal? Okay, so here's what I'm going to say about a maintenance goal, Mandy. Um, first of all, Cindy and I don't do we're gonna goals ask. because oh. our greatest fear is that we're going to give you a chart. We've seen it. Verbatim oh. what we say. Mm. Now, here's what I get I'm going to say about yeah. a maintenance goal. Who is the focus of the goal? Mm-hmm. What is the impairment that you're trying to stabilize, right? Mm-hmm. What do you want not to get worse, to deteriorate or decline within the right. normal constraints of the disease process, right? If it's MS, if it's tertiary Parkinson's, I get it. If mm-hmm. it's ALS, that's the normal disease process. But what is it that you want to see that if you came back in three months, six months, I don't know, 12 months, what's the evidence show us about the, that disease process? Have you reduced the risk, okay? Okay. How mm-hmm. are you going to measure it? What test? So you're looking for stabilization of function. And how are you going to measure that? Well, you got to get a baseline measurement of what the impairment is, right? Mm-hmm. And so but then we don't do tests and measures on maintenance. What are oh, you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Why would I measure something that isn't going to get better? Because we can show we stabilize it. But right? then when I redo the test, the score is basically the same. What was the point of that? So, so here's what I would say. If you okay. want an example for somebody with a chronic disease, right? Let's say this is a person who has CHF and COPD and is very impaired aerobically and is not going to necessarily recover to age and gender norms. I still might do a two-minute step test and look for them to be 75% of their age and gender norms, right, of that mm-hmm. from where they are now to be able to complete their activity, which might be bathing or very metabolically demanding, right? And mm-hmm. to be able to do that with, with um, monitoring their own uh, rating of perceived exertion or with a rating of perceived exertion not greater than, right? Demonstrating, mm-hmm. so, so it's a stabilization of functioning, all right? It may be uh, um, improvement in the quality of life measure. We have to start looking at some of these global measures. And so that, that would be it. And so how long do I think it's going to take to see stabilization? I don't know. It depends. Would I expect it in two weeks? Would I expect it in four weeks? You know? And, and so I have, I have a feeling that I want to monitor them once I have them in that plateau. I want to monitor them for a longer period of time. I'm not going every week. I'm not re- just doing the same thing over and over again. I want to transfer that to them, and I want to see that they demonstrate those skills apply that education, and they have a stabilization from where I took them when they hit the plateau, there they are, and over time, as they're doing their activities, they continue to maintain that level, right? And I can go back and measure that. Maybe I gave them an exercise program. Maybe they gave them an aerobic capacity program. Maybe they're on a walking program or something like that. And so I see that it has the intended effect, that's my thoughts. But, okay. But I think part but I think part of it, Mandy, is is we touched on it earlier. The yeah. word itself, maintenance, makes people get uncomfortable. Yeah. Or shut it down and say, I'm not going to talk about this. So you've heard D and I use this word repeatedly just yeah. this evening. <laughs> what we're trying to change the conversation with is to say, let's stop with the word then, if that's what's giving you the the hives and the cooties, and just say what we're really focusing on is stabilization of function. Okay. And I think for many therapists, when you say it that way, we relate to it differently when then you, then when you say maintenance therapy. And, and we're not saying it's you know, a, a semantic issue, but that word has so much baggage with it that it can impede constructive discussion of how does our skill set contribute to this particular part of the benefit. And we can say, I understand my value in stabilizing this patient. I think many times we see that drop the stress level 
from the get go, as opposed to saying, do you maintenance? Do, do, do you do maintenance? No, I don't. Why would I ever want to do that? That's not really therapy. That's seeing people for like five, 10 years at a cliff. And we just don't do that here. I mean, in a recent conversation, I was informed by one home health agency that their entire state had not a single patient in it that would ever need maintenance therapy. They proclaimed that the entire state was exempt. What, are you what does that say? <laughs> Yes. What are you doing? But, but I think that helps. Uh, it, it, whether it's you know an inpatient facility, an outpatient center, and how home health, I think we really have to reframe the conversation in terms of our ability to stabilize function, and stop with the reactionary feel we get the minute somebody says maintenance. Yeah, and it sounds smarter too. Stabilization yes, function. Ah. Than all, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, listen. Let's get, yeah. Yeah. It's all about the magic that you bring that no one else is going to bring. <laughs> Right? It's true. the magic that is me. You guys exactly. all have those stories where somebody does the, oh, should have had a V8, right? Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> all I say in the back of my own head, I don't let it out. <laughs> Amazingly, I don't let it out is because you're not me. You don't bring the magic. I don't. I don't. That's right. You know, awesome. if, it, uh, if anybody could figure it out, they would have solved it before you got there, y'all. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't trade down on don't your Don't give it away. She dropped the y'all. So if y'all are interested in maintenance therapy – uh, or stabilization of function. Um, Barry put a link in the chat box to where you can find the book that they've done that you know will answer. I guarantee you all the questions that you will have about that topic. Um, and but, I don't mean to, I'm not going to sell that, but we deal with that, Mandy. We right. actually take a case yeah, right. scenario from the start to the end mm-hmm. and we practice goal writings and we do reassessments, mandatory mm-hmm. reassessments, because it's not about the theory of it. It's about the application that we get, you know, we get tripped up on and it mm-hmm. takes time. And it, we really have to kind of switch the way we've been programmed and, and we've, uh, we, we've bought into thinking mm-hmm. that if we don't get people better, we have no role. And that's yeah. bogus. Right. Well, D, D, you even said the word plateau. I mean, that's another word that causes all kinds of. I mean, you said get him to the plateau and keep him there. I mean, uh, I know I've got to give away. Freak out. Listen, yes. I'm going to have to turn in my therapy card. <laughs> that's right, because we are, a plateau is 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 a dirty word in, mm-hmm. in, in our professions. About you just don't want that. That means three strikes and you're out. However mm-hmm. many treatments and we must leave you. And I think part of it, briefly, is when we start to embrace the idea of stabilization and maintenance. I've seen clinicians who I think have a certain degree of guilt because they start to realize that there's patients that they could have kept and should have kept and didn't because they thought they were following the rules. Yeah. So I've told you, we almost need to develop like the stages of grief. We're going to need the equivalent of the stages of the acceptance of maintenance therapy because it, when we do groups, we do training with groups, you can watch people get angry. You can watch people get <laughs> upset. You can watch denial. people have that denial. That, oh, there's no patients that need this. And then the, when, right before acceptance, you'll start looking at people and you're going, I know exactly what they're doing, which is that guy I discharged, that guy, that, oh my gosh, you're telling me this was part of the benefit and I could have done it and I didn't do it. I, but I, I always view that as now we're thinking differently. That That's our biggest roadblock is it's not just let's look at the regulation and say you can do it, but it's trying to get out of our own way to do it. That's our biggest challenge. And I think we face it more than our nursing counterparts because they have always been in there with patients that people don't expect to get better. We've always had that arbitrary, we'll let you in if we think they can improve. And if you can't really do that, you have to leave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let, let's steer the the ship away from maintenance for a little bit. This this is a good question since since we have some some PTs and you know some OTs codas in in the audience as well. We probably have some PTAs too. So uh, a PT asks this question. So as a PT uh, and if an OT is also seeing this patient, I will sometimes put per OT for upper extremity strength slash range of motion just so we don't have discrepancies. Um, is this not the right thing to do? Red flags? What would you say to that? Well, the first thing is that my only concern of any sort of discrepancies would mean that both parties are actually measuring it with a legit goniometer, which right there I would be celebratory in that fact that they weren't just a bunch of numbers that end in zero and five hmm. or, or have just a line um, down the thing for those still on paper is to imply that, you know what, when you really have everything that ends in zero and five and both sides are exactly the same, what you're really saying is I didn't actually measure it. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, the concern about that, and I, I will punt the rest of that question to D, but for me, the, the discrepancy issue, I, I would love to see measures that are actually measures and not guesstimates or percentages or limited or decreased as being the extent of 
a range of motion assessment. But but D, don't I have to do every joint in a, in the whole limb of the entire body when I do yeah, this? Yeah, I'm really disappointed that most PTs don't do toe flexion and extension. What? Well, they document that they did. I know. They didn't okay, so it. so if you didn't do it and you documented it, that's the bad F word. And that doesn't uh-huh. you should be fired, but that's not what happens, right? <laughs> it's fraud. So, mm-hmm. so so my statement is I don't think that there's as great a discrepancy if we use uh, objective measures. And there are objective measures for screening of upper body strength, such as the arm curl test, um, or lower body strength, the five times sit to stand or the 30 second chair stand. So if we all administer and that test in the, in the, um, consistent with the, with the way it should be in a standardized version, we should come up with the right numbers, right? Or similar in the same category. Depend upon the time of day, day. Do I think it's bad that we defer things? No. If I don't do it, I don't, I just, you don't even, you don't even have to put why, you know, if OT's in there, I got to focus on the stuff I got to focus on. I don't even say, you know, deferred, um, you know, cause I may have to look at strength if they're using an assist device, a unilateral mm-hmm. bilateral device, I may need to know certain kinds of strength. So, so my statement is only write what you do. I don't think it's bad that you don't do everything, but try to pick objective objective, uh, standardized, validated measures when they exist. You know, this idea that, you know, every PT rides the Tenetti tug train is amazing to me. You know, as if, if you do the Tenetti and tug, you should be able to cook a meal, take a shower, get to the doctors and climb stairs. And guys, that's not the way it works. You know, I mean, we have to have multiple uh, tools in our toolkit. And so start with some of the objective measures. And you're saying, well, you know, these standardized measures, they don't cover every muscle. Well, then go ahead and do a manual muscle test on those specific prime movers, right? But do it the way Flor- you would make Florence Kendall proud. Right? <laughs> I mean, you know, do her a solid and, and put them in the manual muscle test position and don't, don't modify it. Be, be true to the test um, and, and, and demonstrate your scientific skill. So, Mandy, ultimately, or Dustin, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think it's a problem if we defer things. I don't think it's a problem if you don't do it. The problem is if we do nothing, yeah. or we have nothing that you can hang your hat on that is specific and detailed, then how do you set a goal, whether it's progress, you know, rehabilitation or maintenance? How do you set a goal if you have a lot of within functional and, and, and household ambulator stuff and, ext- and severely poor endurance? How do you measure that stuff? We got to, I think, get back to a little bit more um, specificity in our, in our testing. But, but my concern with the defer is that when I see it, when I audit and review people's documentation, it's not a patient-specific. Um, they're not using any sort of equipment from a PT perspective. They're not using a walker or a cane. So I'm not going to really get into the weeds of the upper extremities. I'm leaving that over. That's one thing. But what I tend to see on audits is, systematically, every time the PT knows OTs in, they just punt the arms, punt the arms, punt the arms. Then I think we're getting into a problem because if they are using a two-handed device, then I do need to know, is upper extremity issues going to complicate this piece? It's it's not like the legs just walk around in isolation. If they're going to have to use their, their arms are part of the transfer. Their arms are part of other things. So when I see it systematically as though anytime I know an OT is in here, I just punt it, that's where I think we've crossed the line. That says I need to, whether it is the arm curl test or a screen of prime movers, we need to do something unless we're truly saying, I think part of what needs to come with the FERD is then I don't want to see anything in your plan talking about you need to do any sort of upper body anything, PT, because you've just deemed it someone else's full domain for which you have nothing to say. So, uh, but I do think some of the concern about inconsistency, you touched on it briefly, Dee. Does it, is it bad if one of us went in the morning and one of us went in the afternoon and got different numbers? I mean, what that says is certain times a day, our patients do better than others, which means they're not independent just because you can do it between certain times of the day. If he's worse later, and don't be putting that finger at me. I got to say something. (laughs) Because I see that. You're leaning in. You're leaning in. And fortunately, we are many states apart. Dustin's in between, but you can't get in him either. Dustin's Um, drinking. Okay, but, that's but, all I'm saying. But that's, that's where I think, you know, the whole cut, in, cut them in half and that's not mine and I don't need to do this and I'm just going to punt it because that would be, I mean, to me, that's the equivalent of, of then turning around to the same OT and saying, you better never talk about them walking anywhere because that's mine. What, really? What are we really saying about our patients? 
in terms of that patient. And, and when, when we find those discrepancies, I think it speaks volumes about their need for skilled services because they can't just be, well, they can, you know, bathe only between the hours of 11 and 12 is the window. And if you miss the window, they can't do it at all. But as long as we got that one hour, we are successful. That, that's not how people live. And I think we need to think about some of those inconsistencies are, are appropriate and, and should be documented. Listen, the best eval, you want a true baseline on a patient, go after the home health aid. If you're in home care, go mm. after the home health aid, mm. gives them a bath, or after the speech path does the treatment with them. They're exhausted. Mm. I try to catch people. They're like, you're not going to come with me every time after I come from the doctor. I'm mm. like, no, but you live by yourself, folk. You know, yeah. you got you got to make yourself something to eat and get your dog outside so it doesn't poop all over the floor. So, hey, if you can't come home from the doctors and still function for a little bit to get yourself something to eat, you, Mr. Diabetic, and make sure that you don't have dog uh, poop and pee all over your floor and you slip and fall in it, then I'm going to come and evaluate you then because that's your true baseline. Not when you feel good. That's when I'll come work with you when you feel good. And so we have to think about that, not just in home care, but think about, you know, after they come back from the doctors, if they're Mm. in a skilled nursing setting or if they're in an uh, an, uh, inpatient rehab, and that's probably not as big a, a difference, but think about it from the perspective. If you think your patients are ready to go home after three hours of therapy, follow OT doing a bath, follow speech, giving a treatment, then PT go in there and walk them around and just see how well they do on their Tinetti and their tug because it's in a different situation. Absolutely. We want to get the truest picture of that patient, not the optimal, the truest picture of them. But, but quick sidebar, D, I want to remind folks in the do home health, we can do PTOT, PTOT speech on the same day. It, it's staggering to me how that myth has gone on forever that says you cannot provide more than one therapy per day in home health. I understand when agencies want to spread out visits to have, you know, an encounter with the patient as, as many different days as possible. But this idea that I am forbidden by some regulation to go on the same day as another therapy discipline is categorically untrue. And that came up at combined section meeting, Dustin. We, we didn't think that was an issue in one and it just exploded in the whole, I've been told we can't, I can't go the same day. And, and, and Mandy, you know, in other settings, they, it is done back to back. It is done on the same oh, day. So why would home oh, health suddenly God. have this rule that we're going to burst into flame if they get more than one therapy a day? Yeah. So just reminders for the home health people. I'm sure, you know, everybody's heard in their home health career somewhere along the lines, if you can't go with the same day time. See, I used to do the same thing and be like, you know, uh, oh, I forgot OT was coming. Come on, tell them you're dirty, ugly. Don't walk them outside (laughs) on the grass. They're not home. Oh, yeah. When I started home care, my orientation, no, that was my orientation on the mouth. They said, do not ever document the patient walked on grass because I meant they went on site. And I said, oh, okay, so we're going to walk on uneven surfaces. Uh, I'm not going to identify it as grass. You're right. But, but I think that happens. And I used to do that and say, oh, I forgot your OT was coming at this time. You know, yeah. it's okay. I know you just yeah. finished with them, but let's keep going because yeah. that's not how life works in just individual compartments of function. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good one. Hey, I just want to kind of bang or um, piggyback on uh, <laughs> D. You were what? talking about what? A what? <laughs> I'm sorry. That's Boy, I think I'm done now. This is the end of our time, correct? <laughs> You're going to make me lose my train of thought. Sorry. Am I the only one that thought Mandy wants to bag something? Because that's That's what she said. That's what she said. You know those OTs? Hey, D, you're the one who put together that session, Sex is an ADL. So I got nothing. It is. It is an ADL. Sex is an ADL. That is a podcast I need to be addressing. Anyway, whole other topic. Anyway. (laughs) Talking about endurance. (laughs) So one of the questions... (laughs) I'm not saying anything. I know. I was talking about in documenting endurance activity or activity intolerance. And so oh. someone is saying, my, my facility has actually discouraged these terms in documentation. How else can I document these? And then kind of going along those same lines, you know, how else do you measure fatigue okay. other than using the board or the Okay. RP? There is no blackballed word. I know, but they they call it aerobic capacity. Call it whatever you want. Here's my thing. It's how you demonstrate skilled, reasonable, and necessary. Yeah. Right? That's Mm -hmm. what it's about. And so I don't care what you call it. In fact, the regulations in home care, chapter seven, which I'm Mm -hmm. sure you can find in chapter eight for skilled nursing and chapter one for inpatient rehab and chapter 15 of the Medicare benefit payment manual. That's that's memorized. Right? (laughs) You can find it all. Where they use this term 
terminology. It's not about the terminology. Mm -hmm. I think what it is is what you're saying. So here's my thing. When you document endurance as poor, and then you have somebody who's severely poor, as if there's a a floor, a basement below poor, (laughs) I have no way to know what that means. And so it's not necessarily about the word. There are objective measures. So I use the rating of perceived exertion, whether Mm -hmm. the modified or the original Borg 6 through 20. Um, and I teach the patients to do that. You can do a walk-talk test, right? You mm-hmm. can do a two-minute step test. You can do um, a two-minute walk test. You can do a lot of different things, and they're going to correlate, okay? Mm-hmm. And so um, it, there's also dyspnea scales. There's a, a, taking pulse oxes. These, there's a lot of ways that you can teach a patient to self-monitor, but you can also quantify and objectively um, – uh, categorize the, the, the level of impairment. And so there's enough things. You want to know more about that? Rehabmeasures.org, okay, okay. or the NIH mm-hmm. toolbox. This is where you can find that. They give you the populations. They give you all the psychometric properties. Or if you're a member of the home health section, okay, you can go uh, to the home health section, the APTA. There's a toolkit in there for, what, for tests and measures that can be validly and reliably administered in the home. But I have another thing. I'm going to my shelf, Mandy. Hold on. What's she going to get? More resources? Have you guys heard of this? The Home Health Care Guide for Occupational Therapy Practice, published by one of your people, Karen Vance, editing it. Oh, it's a phenomenal. Look at that thick book. Woo. <laughs> this is a great, great instrument for you. And so she talks a lot about how we document and what we do in the home care setting. So I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to leave that out, but um, it's not about the word. Don't get caught on the word. Mm -hmm. caught on what is it that I provide that is indispensable to this patient that nobody else brings that magic that wouldn't get taken care of if I wasn't there and then call it what you want like I blow people's minds ready Dustin I write gate distances in the home for over a thousand feet no what yeah if I have somebody who was okay. independent, I have written it, who lived on their own, had to get out, get their own dr- medications, get their own um, uh, food, get themselves to the doctor, and they lived down a country mile, all right, or they had a mailbox at the end of the, the Lime Rock Road, mm-hmm. I had to be able to show that they could function for those distances. And the cardiopulmonary journal of the APTA I said um, they consider some of the baseline measures are almost 600 meters, yep. four to 600 meters to be truly independent in the community for mm-hmm. cardiopulmonarily. And if, I'm doing a lot of illies, aren't I? Cardiopulmonarily. <laughs> You're making up words. But think about what really is um, functional for a community mobile person. And it's not 150 d- feet down the, down to the mailbox in home care or down the hallway to the PT gym for in inpatient rehab or skilled nursing. That's not functional in the community. And so mm-hmm. I think that, um, it, there's ways that we can measure it. I think a great one, if you don't have a lot of, uh, instruments on you, Mandy is a walk talk test. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Dale Avers, um, uh, did a great comparison of multiple, um, uh, measures, you know, looking at the Borg rating, the traditional, the modified zero to 10, the walk talk test, um, a two minute step, um, uh, O2 sats percentage exertion. It, it was in the, uh, it was in a geriatric. I don't know if it was the Journal of Geriatrics, but if anybody's interested in that, I have that. I have that graphic, and just reach out to Dustin or Mandy, and I can get it for you. But it's a great resource. We don't have to invent the wheel on this stuff. Yeah. But but Dee and I have talked about this. I, I hope to live long enough that in the therapy universe, the tools like the Borg are as automatically employed as the zero to 10 pain scale. Mm, I mean, come yeah. on, you don't even have to ask a patient anymore. They say, hello, I'm a four. Good, thank you. I already got that <laughs> yeah. in here because you've been asked it so many times. Yet this phobia about endurance that we've heard we couldn't use it. And, and, and I have to share what I don't want to see. And that's where people tend to go into the arbitrary, you know, patient will tolerate standing times 10 minutes to improve ADL. <laughs> I swear anybody who writes that should be forced to stand in the corner for 10 minutes and tell me what ADL they picked. Because that kind of stuff does not lend the value of what Dee was just talking about. Mm-hmm. So I think some of it is really using those types of tools and be, being so comfortable with them, but also absolutely connecting whatever you identify as that endurance-related deficit or aerobic capacity or activity tolerance, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. what specific functional things for that patient is it impeding? Mm-hmm. And I have a question for you, Mandy. 
because, oh. you know, I, I just have well, to ask. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I, I swear when it comes to Medicare focus on showing that what we do is both measurable and meaningful, OT got handed the kings to the king, keys to the kingdom about being functionally relevant, bathing, dressing, meal prep. I mean, we're just taking people on long walks to nowhere, maybe the random mailbox, um, and then usually right to the mailbox, never to come back from it again. You know, forget basic English. We just abandon them at the curb. Um, but, you know, OT has all of this to, at their disposal, yet what I see far too often is it's documented as ADLs will be this and ADLs will be that. Uh, your thoughts on the whole lumping them into one group as opposed to addressing them specifically? Well, I, my personal quote pet peeve is I think if people um, would evaluate on the front end more um, in depth, like you said, use more objective measures and everything, your goals correlate and are just so much easier. Yeah. And I think what happens is people don't use those objective measures. They are kind of doing an, uh, an evaluation, but not a true evaluation. And they're trying to just lump goals because they may only have like four lines on their piece of paper or in their, you know, EMR or whatever mm-hmm. it is. And, and honestly, I think also from my personal experience, you know, where I'm, I work and it's like the process of updating those goals turns into a pain in the butt. Yeah. So then what people want people want to do is you want to try to get as broad by but still being in, you know, the regulations and still making goals that you can achieve. Um, but oh, wait, wait a minute. Time. Okay, you want to do that because it's easier, right? I, I I'm just saying, I know it. Well, I, I mean, I hear it all the time. I, 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 I yeah. understand that. I, I yeah. don't disagree. Yeah. The EMRs don't make it easy, but I don't know if that's really how we demonstrate that we're practicing the highest mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. level of our profession to the greatest expanse of our licensure and showing our skill. Mm-hmm. I mean, somewhere we have to say, stop the insanity. And I'm sorry <laughs> I picked up one of my dogs, but she was whining. <laughs> <Her> whining. <laughs> Chicky, it's that time of the night. Chicky is whining at me. So <laughs> That's fine. Okay. I'm, but, I'm gonna... but I understand, Mandy. I get what yeah. you're saying, but that, that does not forgive us. I agree, yeah. but for, that, for I think taking that route, but it's, it's real. It's, it's, it's administrative. Real. That's burden. exactly right. Yeah. It's administrative burden. And, 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 you know, the APTA is looking at administrative burden when we're talking about the physician fee schedule and MIPS and MACRA, we need to get in on these conversations of administrative burden because the EMRs don't make it easy for us to document what we're mandated to provide for third party payers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's rise up on that account. Let's mm-hmm. not just lay down and do what the box tells us. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to uh, wrap up with one. It went so fast. I know. That's <laughs> what happens when you hang out with these ladies. Um, wrap up with one more question. So, D, Cindy, answer this uh, in one to two minutes. All right. Oh. I'm going to challenge Ooh. you. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <two> minutes. <laughs> and I think this is a, a good question to kind of, um, some big takeaway points for all of us, but a lot of people in leadership, but then a lot of us that are on our computers for hours every day, you know, trying to finish our notes. Um, but Casey, uh, I know, I know Casey, or I, I know of Casey, uh, he, he's a PT. He has been orienting five new therapists, OTs and PTs in the last three months. His head is absolutely spinning. He asked, what is the most important message needed in providing clear direction to these new home care therapists in the area of documentation and how to provide appropriate accountability, oversight, and a good baseline of, and this question ran out, but what, what's the most important message that you would give someone new in home health, but let's just say therapists in general, new therapists. When we talk about documentation, what are the kind of big nuggets or the takeaways you want to make sure that they have down pat when they start working? Who gets to go first, Dustin? <laughs> go ahead, Cindy. Okay. I, I would say the, the biggest one is actually our own resentment of documentation. I think we have to stop with this idea that I can be a good therapist and document poorly. I think that I know we didn't choose this discipline based on the amount of documentation we would have to generate, but our frustration, our apathy leads to poor content. That's just a vicious cycle of, 
people questioning your clinical judgment, refusing to pay for your services, and ultimately developing new payment models that say your value is not even, you know, really all that phenomenal. Um, we're going to pay less for what you do because it looks like my daughter could do the same thing. Hmm. I think that's part of the, if, if we can get people engaged in it, as opposed to give me the magic words, give me the words to say or not say, it's all my EMR's fault. I think it's embracing that this is an extension of my clinic, my clinical skill. This is, I'm writing notes to self so that if someone asks me later, not just what did I do, but why did I do it? I'm able to go back to that documentation and see it. I think we've done our disciplines a tremendous disservice by making this a, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. Uh, if you don't document it, we don't get paid because we're not, our head is not in this because of the payment piece. It's the patient piece. And so we look for the quick fix. We look for the phraseology. We look for the magic EMR. And in the meantime, we're generating documentation that allows third-party payers and, and the mothership of them all, CMS, to say what you do could be done by somebody for free. Mm -hmm. And we get mad and say it's because you don't understand therapy, but we don't own what we write. So often what, when Dee and I do audits and show people back their examples, mm -hmm. I don't think they've even read it. I mean, who on earth would write patient endorses incontinence? <laughs> what, they think endorses incontinence is so wonderful they're going to go out and do commercials? I mean, <laughs> is that really what you meant to say? Oh, it was an accident. No, it's a lack of engagement. And I accident. think that's where... <laughs> You know, that, that's where, right. That's, that's where I, I think that's the piece we have to ground people in. This is your documentation. And I think we try all this external accountability and beat them to death that it's about payment and it never changes it because people get resentful and just say, fine, I'll never say the word endurance again and we'll get paid. I would say um, to the person asked the question, um, you have to know what is expected for payment. I mean, this idea that we're doing it out of the goodness of our hearts, we're getting paid. We have to be accountable when we put our signature on the bottom line. Yep. And so if in home care, what gets us paid is skilled, reasonable, and necessary. That's what gets us paid. I don't care if you walk 150 feet or 1,000 feet. If it does not demonstrate the need for skilled intervention, it's not going to get covered. Cindy and I look at audits from um, MAC uh, ADRs all the way to ZPICs. OK, we do a lot of that. We write redetermination letters from ALJ decisions that are going to the Medicare Appeals Council. Always cited the payer source, whether it's workers comp or it's private insurance or it's Medicare. OK, and many of the private insurances, as Medicare goes, they go. As CMS goes, they go. Understand the regulatory guidance would be a very important thing. Now, it doesn't mean you have to sleep with it under your pillow, but you should at least read the regulatory requirements. Because when I read that in Chapter 7 for home care, I know no one else could do what I do because it's in the language. It makes sense to me. Hmm. I'm not a nurse. I can't do what they do, but I can read what the therapists are supposed to do. And I can demonstrate that in my language. And so, you know, in my documentation, and that's what I spend my time on. I don't reiterate all the things the patient does. I do what I provide, what my assessment of what they did, how they did it, how much hmm. effort. Did they make progress? Are they stabilized? Because they're paying for my pro professional opinion, right? That's what yep. they're paying for. And so I have to give that information. So if you're asking me, know the regulations and own it, right? Mm -hmm. Know the payer source. And that's part of our licensure. That's not yep. your agency. That's not, that's your licensure. You need to be responsible to the third party payers um, in your documentation. So it's not about writing um, more. Right. It's not working harder. It's working smarter. No well, and, one has to document. Well, and that's why we framed it in the back to the SOAP format. I think those are the four key elements that need to be present in documentation, no matter what my EMR is laying it out as or if I'm still on paper or what setting it I'm in. I think we've let parts go. We stopped using subjective because it was either a complaint or they're all mute. And then we reduced assessment to tolerated fairly well. Yes, that's what I've been seeing this past week, Dustin and Mandy. It's, it's, it's moved past just tolerated well. It's fairly well. It's not even well. It's just sort of kind of there. So you abdicate half the content right there. And then you're just regurgitating some arbitrary measure and telling me your plan is to continue. Mm -hmm. I think those are the key pieces of, yes, how do I apply that to my EMR? And I think sometimes those that teach it to their employees need to do a better job within the EMR of telling people which fields need to be completed and which can be skipped. Because I think we waste a lot of time, people that are very detail-oriented, 
writing something in three and four times, three or four different ways in the same document because there were different fields that alluded to the same area. And we don't want people to document it four times. So maybe, yeah, the EMR gave us four options, but as an organization, we need to sit down and say, you know what? What I'm looking for from you is only going to go into this box, and you're going to leave the other three blank. Because I think we have a lot of clinicians that struggle with leaving things blank. When it was paper, I could put a zero or a line or at least let you know I didn't need it. Blanket and EMR can make people very uncomfortable. So I, that's where it goes to the volume issue. I'm sticking things in numerous times. I'm getting mad. Why am I saying the same thing three different ways in the same note? As an organization, it's great that you have an EMR that has options, but sometimes you got to put a team together and say, what are we going to say is the structure of this tool? Yeah. It, it may ask for it four times, but I only want it once, and I don't want it in those other three places. Because as a reviewer, I don't want to have to look in all four spots to try to find it. Right. Mm. right. That's a good point. Good one. All right, folks, it's 9.02 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, I should say. So, yeah, I want to be respectful of your all's time, kind of wrap up here. Uh, before Dee and Cindy kind of, you know, close things, Mandy, do you have any closing remarks or anything you, you wanted to add? I just want to make one little comment. Someone had asked me specifically a question about um, documentation. Um, what info is most important for a coda to document that helps you in completing a progress note or research? I really liked the you're in Cindy's you're, when you were guys were talking about in one of the episodes about how we should almost do a note backwards in the sense that uh, the goals should be the focus. Mm. Because I, I do that as an example. Um, you know, I work PRN at a lot of facilities and I go in there and I don't I always get to look at the evaluation. So if you, if you think about doing it a little bit backwards, everything that we should be documenting, this is my opinion, it should be focused on the goals and right? Like how, and how does that translate to function? Mm. And so sometimes you just go in there and you see all these notes and documentation of just what p- the patient did. And I'm like, I actually have no idea where the patient currently is. I have no idea what the, what goal you're actually maybe working on. Mm. Um, so the upside down kind of, so, you know, starting with the goal was a really, I think a really good idea and a good um, way to kind of think about documenting just those daily notes as well for those that are not doing the evaluation, but just the daily notes of it all. So anyway, and then on a side note, I'm really glad everybody came. (laughs) Yeah. That's really cool. Um, All right. So Cindy D just kind of any closing remarks, Um, Cindy, if you could go first and then D just kind of wrap us up and then let people know how they could, um, you know, learn more about, you know, what you all do and all the good information that you all have out there. So, Cindy. Well, I think our, our goal, um, yes, it tends to be more home health focused, but we, we've really been looking at more of the, the whole commonality of issues across post-acute care. Mm-hmm. And, and as therapists, this whole, you know, I'm the sniff, I'm the earth, I'm the this. It is not sustainable. We have to really be collaborative. And, and, and I, I've been using the analogy of we really need to become the, the Santa in, in the uh, Miracle on 34th Street story uh, where he said, you know, this is what I have at my store, but this is not what you need. It's over there. And I think a lot of times our payer sources set us up for, you know, home health. You keep them out of the sniff and sniff going, wait a minute, what are you talking about taking them away from me? And we all got to protect our own. I think it's that collaborative piece. And as such, we try to build resources to help that larger continuum really get back to the business of focusing on patient care and getting unstuck from things like, oh my gosh, it's the COPs. Oh my gosh, it's the new payment model. Oh my gosh, it's documentation. How do we really help people be successful long-term? Um, and, and so we try to build resources that are practical. We, we generally think they're entertaining. If nothing else, Dee and I can amuse ourselves. We've said that. <laughs> it's worse now. It's horrible. She's ruined me because I used to be perfectly fine presenting on my own. Now it's like, oh, come on. At least if she's here, we'll both track each other up because sometimes it's a tough crowd because who really wants to say, hey, we're coming in to talk to you for four hours about documentation. <laughs> Rather stab myself in the eye. Um, but, but really trying to be that resource to people to, to find the information they need and, and to really get past this because nobody really wants to go to any more training about documentation. We know this. So we got to master it. We got to move on. So we can talk about care redesign. We can talk about chronic disease management, exercises, medication, all of those things that we do get excited about as therapists, um, but we have to make sure those foundational pieces are there. So Cornelian Craft is really built on getting people unstuck with practical mm-hmm. resources. Um, we are have no interest in becoming long-term codependent. Um, in terms of here's a little bit of information, but here's a little bit more, here's a little bit more. No, it's here. I, I think it's a therapist and all of us on this call here that go, I, I don't really want to live with you. 
um, here's the tools you need to, to fix this and we'll help you fix it, but then let's move on to something else. Um, because we really want to see people be successful as therapists, no matter what setting they're in. Yep. All right, D wrap us up. Uh, but it's a bad visual when it looks like Chicky sleeping. Can you at least wake <laughs> her up? I mean, come on. Chicky's like, yeah. Oh, I've just given up. I'm a he was singing before I made it. Listen, you know, I really, I don't want to, um, end on anything other than an opportunity to thank the people for engaging. I think that, that we're all very activated within our um, licensure and within our work settings, but don't forget your professional organizations. They, mm-hmm. they are who represent you and realize that we are part of a bigger community for population health and we will survive and we will thrive regardless of the setting that we provide care in for an ever aging population and anything we can do to help reduce costs. And there's a lot of good literature out there now that talks mm-hmm. about the importance of therapy in reducing rehospitalization. These are the things that I mm-hmm. think that we need to start to in- incorporate into our practice. They need to inform us and they need to drive, drive how we make decisions for our, for our patients. And then we simply, I got chickie's ear hair in my mouth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, <laughs> simply have to go about understanding that nobody does what we do and we are the best documentation tool you have is right mm. between your two ears. Mm. It's the best documentation tool you have. <laughs> awesome. All right, folks, I, 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 that's a great place to stop. Uh, I would call on Sherry, but I'm, I'm going to be uh, nice to her. But uh, so that's Cornetti and Craft Healthcare Solutions, valuebeyondthevisit.com. Uh, look in the chat box. I'll put their uh, link in there. If we didn't get to your questions, which we apologize uh, for not being able to get to them, go to that website because I guarantee you they're going to have something that's going to answer uh, your question in some way, shape, or form. And if not, if not, c- c- so Sherry, go ahead and put our email addresses in there mm-hmm. or Dustin. Yeah. Please feel mm-hmm. free to reach out to us because it's all about you know raising the bar, practicing to the top mm-hmm. of our license yep. for this entire right. community. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Yes, website, thank you very much. Go to the contact button on our website. Um, like Dustin said, www.visit.com. <laughs> and it comes straight to me and I'll hook you up with D and Cindy. Okay. Yep. Whoever you may be, voice of the dark box. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, well, good stuff, uh, everyone, for, um, well, the participants for coming, hanging out with yeah. us. Asking questions. Yeah. And then uh, Mandy and Kay and Kay yes. uh, for hanging out. Thanks. I'm going to say uh, cheers, y'all. <laughs> you you go up 10 points in my book if you use y'all. Really? Yes. I might be out. I might be that's, out. That's How my come goal? you're not drinking in the library, man? <laughs> well, you know, I'm trying to be professional. <laughs> oh. But, oh, she, is in, but they, she is in Colorado. I'm just saying. saying they do other yeah. things she, is, she, she could be yeah. doing other stuff because it is Colorado. <laughs> no just comment. No comment. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you Thanks, all. Uh, we'll be in touch soon. With Bye. we'll try and get some links together to the mentioned resources. And if this recorded appropriately or well, uh, then we'll share that in the email as well. So we'll be in touch soon. Uh, but y'all have a good evening. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.